Welcome to the Attorney Post, your source for inside baseball talk about the legal field with the top attorneys in the country. Here's your host, Justin West. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Attorney Post, where we discuss what's going on with various facets of the law with attorneys that are at the top of their game to help you navigate the ins and outs of the legal field and various jurisdictions. Because as we always say, if you don't know your rights, you don't have any. I am incredibly pleased today uh, to be meeting with Greg Francis. Uh, Greg Francis it is a uh, an attorney who practices law. Uh, down in Florida, and he is with uh, Osborne and Francis, but he's got an interesting story to tell us today. Uh, he actually just wrote a book. Uh, he does do uh, injury law. He does uh, a number of different things. In fact, we're going to jump over really quickly and show uh, his website. Um, and actually, I'm going to show you the wrong one first. So this is Osborne and Francis. Their uh, website is realtoughlawyers.com. They are personal injury attorneys, and you can find out all about them. They're highly rated, uh, highly awarded, and everything else. Uh, but he also has a book coming out, and uh, the book is being published by Simon & Schuster. It's called Just Harvest, the story of how Black farmers won the largest civil rights case in the U.S. against the U.S. government. Um, you can pre-order the book right now, and it's coming out. I think I think it's available now-ish. Uh, Actually, it's out right now. It's out right now. There you go. Uh, so uh, ignore that. You can buy it right now. And uh, there's links to all the places you can buy it here on this site. We will have links down below uh, in the description as well. Before we get started, I do like to read uh, from one of our sponsors. Uh, and our first sponsor today is uh, Groove Funnels. So we're going to jump over there really quickly. Um, if you enjoy spending $5,000 on a brand new website and you love $100 a month bills to host a platform that allows you to sell products to your potential clients and customers, then you should probably stick with your current platform. But if you're like me, you probably don't. And that's why I recommend Groove Pages. Groove Pages is the all-in-one new website funnel sales platform from internet marketing legend Mike Vilsane. You can visit theattorneypost.com slash groove to learn more or to even sign up and get a free website. You can actually build up a three complete websites, sell unlimited products, and attract affiliates all without any fees. It's the last online sales system you're ever going to need. It is basically a Swiss army knife that replaces all sorts of different uh, com- different web apps and, and, and applications from ClickFunnels and SamCart to Kajabi, Vimeo, Shopify, uh, Zapier, WordPress, and more. Visit theattorneypost.com slash groove to learn more or to sign up. Again, that's theattorneypost.com slash groove. All right. And now I am joined with uh, Greg. Uh, Greg, how are you doing today? day. Great, great. I'm doing great, Justin. How are you? I'm doing very good. Thank you very much for uh, taking time to meet with me today. So Greg uh, has quite the uh, the, the history here. Um, you earned your Bachelor's of uh, Criminal Arts, I'm sorry, Bachelor of Arts in Criminal Justice uh, from the University of Florida in 91. And you got your JD in 94 from University of Florida Law School. Uh, you were the Virgil Hawkins uh, Fellow uh, when you did that. And uh, you also received uh, honors for writing and oral uh, honors in uh, appellate advocacy. In 2008, you joined your friend, uh, Joseph Osborne and forming your own firm, uh, Osborne and Francis, which we just saw. Again, link in the description, realtoughlawyers.com. I love the URL, by the way. That's really great. Um, you have uh, offices in Boca Raton and Orlando. So you serve clients at least all throughout Florida. You can let us know if you uh, serve them in, in other jurisdictions as well. You guys focus primarily, if I'm not mistaken, on product liability, medical device litigation, pharmaceutical litigation, and medical malpractice and personal injury. Um, you also uh, serve, if I'm not mistaken, as the lead counsel, or you've served for the lead counsel for the historic Black Farmers case. And that's one of the big things we're going to be talking about today. Uh, It's a national class action lawsuit um, for the ongoing disparate treatment of Black farmers across the United States, resulting in a massive $1.25 billion settlement. Um, And again, you're going to be able to see all sorts of stuff about this. We have a a link to the website down below where we talk about the book. So first question first that I always like to ask people, Greg, is what did I miss? Uh, You didn't really miss much. Uh, Other than we, uh, as a practice, we have a nationwide practice representing individuals all over America involving those exact cases that that you mentioned, uh, products liability, medical malpractice, um, and and personal injury, uh, in addition to civil rights cases. Awesome. Awesome. Very good. So let's get started on a very general tone. Um, What got you into the practice of law in the first place, Greg? Was it, were you one of those kids that just knew you wanted to be an attorney when you grew up? Or is this something that you kind of stumbled across in, in, in college and high school and thought, you know, maybe law school is where I should go. What got you into law? And then what got you into the particular facets that you're in right now? You know, the, the, the true story is that um, I, I, I did not go to go to college and in, intending to be a lawyer. I didn't know any lawyers growing up, never really thought about being a lawyer. I went to uh, the University of Florida to be an aerospace engineer. I thought I was an excellent student in math, and that's what that would be the profession that I chose. Well, 
that very first semester at the University of Florida was so overwhelming to me uh, and, and demonstrated to me how unprepared I was for this next challenge that I would have of college that I nearly flunked out of school. I, I had a 1.5 GPA and um, had to change my major to something else. Uh, I chose criminal justice um, because that's one of the, actually one of the majors that I could actually get into uh, if I was able to bring up my grade some. And um, as I moved towards graduation, I, I can recall walking to meet some friends of mine and thinking, well, this is, this is it, this is the last year you have to, uh, you're gonna have to go out and get a job in criminal justice. Um, and I said, I didn't wanna be a cop. And uh, I thought, well, what, what am I gonna do? And I remembered many of my fraternity brothers and, and uh, an old girlfriend uh, <laughs> had been to law school. And I thought to myself, you know what? I'll go to law school. I walked in the bookstore that day, bought a um, study aid there was 40 days until the next LSAT test. I studied that book. I broke it down into 40 parts, studied that book and took the LSAT, um, you know, 40 days later and was lucky enough to be awarded a fellowship to uh, attend the University of Florida. That is awesome. That is awesome. And so once you went into law school, um, how did you get into particularly injury law? Is that something that you just had a passion for? I talked to a lot of attorneys in lots of different fields. Um, and I actually have a, I have a real affinity for, for injury attorneys because I think you guys, you serve a real need. You, you make justice more accessible to many people who otherwise couldn't afford an attorney. So I really do appreciate that. But how, how did you get into, into injury law? Uh, it was my it was my desire once I got into law school and after the first uh, couple of courses is to understand or to understand for me that if I was going to be a lawyer that I wanted to be in the courtroom actually litigating and uh, advocating on behalf of of individuals not doing some type of writing behind the scenes or the some other te technical type of law. Um, so we you know in law school uh, every summer you know the the big thing is to get a a summer clerkship with a firm mm -hmm. uh, none of my friends were really getting clerkships with firms and uh, i decided to figure out why so i volunteered in the uh, uh career services center and i would talk to lawyers that were coming in to interview students um and ultimately i started getting better at, at with my interviewing skills as well as knowing what they wanted um, and I knew I wanted to do um, litigation. I didn't know, necessarily want to do criminal litigation. Um, so I had an opportunity as a, after my second year of law school, to clerk for a law firm that did medical malpractice defense work. Gotcha. And kind of just uh, snowballed from there. And you now uh, are a co-partner with uh, your friend uh, who uh, I had the name written down and I just scrolled past my notes there. Uh, Joseph, Osborne. Joseph yeah. Osborne. Yeah. Uh, and so you guys uh, in 2018, so just a few years ago, uh, founded Osborne and Francis. And uh, you guys have quite the successful practice down there. So you, you uh, you're centered in two different places, right? You're down in Boca Raton and, or in Orlando, but you do work right. with clients beyond Florida. Right, right. We, we handle cases all over the country, as I said, in those various fields, especially when you're dealing with medical devices and um, uh, other, other type of uh, implants or whatnot, that, that requires you to have a national practice because, you know, the case may come up uh, anywhere. Gotcha. Okay. No, that makes perfect sense. Um, I know some, I know some attorneys only stick to their, their uh, state's jurisdiction, but some uh, go a lot bigger and it depends on the, the type of case. So that's, that's a, uh... That's interesting. So, all right. So let's talk a little bit more about what you've learned in the process of law. Um, and then we're going to get into some of your, 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 your big wins here. But I do believe personally that, that failure is a, is a big teacher. And I know that every attorney struggles at some point, they, they, they hit a brick wall or something happens. And they're just like, I don't, you know, uh, if that's something that's turned out the way you expect it to go, a, a case doesn't get decided your way. Uh, a witness uh, says the wrong thing or says the right thing in, in the wrong way. Right. Can you tell our listeners, Greg, about a time in your practice of law that you experienced something that would be akin to a failure? But of course, a failure is only a failure if you don't learn from it. So as long as you learn something from it, it's really a slow burn win. So can you can you share a time when you experienced something that would be akin to a failure, but what you learned from it and how you carry that forward into your practice? You know, I think one of the biggest failures that I had in this practice is that I was running so fast and so hard for so long uh, that this book that I wrote, Just Harvest, uh, wasn't written 10 years earlier. This, this is a case that resolved several years ago. And uh, quite frankly, I just kept waiting for someone to write, write about the case. No one knew about the case. Um, uh, once it settled, 
Um, I was not even aware of the case uh, and the issue uh, until I got uh, into it in 2008 when we started getting calls uh, in our Mississippi office at the time. So um, I, I just I, I, I believe that we should have or I should have written this book much sooner because it's a story. It's an American story. It's not my story. It's America's story. And it's a story of what happened to a whole segment of the population that were productive and contributing to America and how the um, uh, involvement of government and, and unjust and corrupt and racist bureaucrats uh, ruined that. Gotcha. So um, a follow-up question I usually have uh, is, is what's one of your biggest successes? I think I can take a stab at that one though. And I'm going to assume it's this, uh, this decision that came down. Is that right? So tell our, tell our listeners about this, this, this case, tell us, tell us everything. How did you really get involved in it? Um, what did the process look like? What was the eventual decision? I know you're still working on it right now. You've got this book that's come out. So, so give us the full scoop. Right. We initially uh, at my, in my old firm, we initially got involved in the case uh, in, in about 2008 when the farm bill was passed, indicating that uh, funds were being set aside for uh, farmers who had been discriminated against had filed their claims, but those claims had not been heard on the merits because uh, those claims were deemed to be late. Um, what happened is in, in, there was a case in 96 that involved uh, discrimination from 1981 to 1996 um, regarding discrimination by the USDA against, against black farmers. Ultimately, after a bunch of uh, investigation and, and some litigation, the USDA decided that it was in their best interest to uh, resolve the case. Um, however, the, many of these farmers, the vast majority of these farmers who were really the ones that were aggrieved, didn't really believe that, in fact, the government that had discriminated against them for tens of, tens of years uh, was now going to compensate them. So while uh, initially about 10,000 farmers were compensated for, uh, for the discrimination, there was probably 70 or 80,000 farmers who had filed claims that were not heard on the merit. So oh. the beginning of this next phase was in 2008, where there was $50 million set aside to, um, to compensate or to, at least to begin the process of compensating these additional these additional farmers, what was we the, didn't know if we were ever going to get any more money, and um, and we are contingency fee lawyers, so this was really a, a leap of faith to get involved in a case such as this because we knew fifty million dollars was not going to be enough to compensate the number right. of farmers that were there. Absolutely. What was the nature of the discrimination that these farmers had suffered? You know, it, it's, it, it varies from place to place, office to office, but uh, in general, the, the USDA provides loans and or grants, uh, sometimes debt relief for, uh, for farmers as a whole across the board. And that, that, that program was sold to America as something that is necessary in order to uh, ensure that with our, our food supply in America is always available. Um, however, when black farmers would go in to get their loan to uh, seek some type of uh, grant uh, or some type of debt relief for their farms, they were systemically denied throughout the system. And how were they just de de uh, denied? It varied from everything from in their face, taking the, the uh, claims for or taking their loan form and throwing it away right in their face. Sometimes they'd be given a runaround where they would say, yeah, you came to this office, but you should go to the office in the county over, uh, understanding that farmers have to work all day and can't travel back and forth like that. And also that farming is, timing is farming is something that, that is very important. So if uh, a farmer misses kind of that period to plant their crops, they've missed that whole, that, that whole, whole season. season. Yeah. So it, it, you know, it varied just from place to place. Sometimes they would take the application and then throw it away afterwards. But uh, what was found what was what bared out by the numbers in the investigation is that uh, there was a only a very small percentage of black farmers who were getting any types of loans, uh, as opposed to their white neighbors who were doing the same work. 
Gotcha. Okay. So it really is a, a case of, of systemic discrimination against, uh, against black farmers. And your, uh, your website says, and I thought this was a great write-up. It says, quote, uh, nearly 20,000 black farmers or their descendants received justice that they had long demanded uh, with this being the largest settlement of a civil rights case in the history of the American civil justice system. Uh, really the largest case that is utterly impressive. What's one of the biggest surprises that, that you stumbled across in, in the process of pursuing this justice, Greg? Uh, the, the, one of the biggest things is just how involved uh, it is to work with the government, to, to litigate against the government, and then uh, to ultimately reach a resolution. Uh, that was just a step in the process. Then after there was a resolution reached uh, in order to go out and get appropriation for, uh, for, the, uh, for the case. Uh, so it was a, I didn't realize that there were that many steps uh, in order to uh, get justice for these folks against the U.S. government. Gotcha. No, that makes, uh, that makes total sense. So um, I had like four different questions I want to ask you. And when it's one of those things where you chase too many rabbits and all of a sudden you, you lose right. all of them. So this book, you got this book and it's coming out right now. Um, it literally just came out on the 18th, whatever you, today is like right. the 21st, something like that. So it just came out this week. Um, obviously again, if you're listening to this podcast right now, we're going to, we're going to rush this one out make sure everyone gets this one as soon as possible. Go down in the, in the link below, buy this book. Uh, it's being published by Simon and Schuster. Uh, it is being delivered. In fact, we'll jump back over to the website really quickly here, just so people can see the website is just harvest book dot com just harvest. And I'm guessing this is a play on words as in a harvest of justice. Is that correct? Uh, that's exactly it. Uh, we, we were able to, after many years of, um, fighting and, and negotiating and uh, litigating uh, these farmers who just wanted to be heard, just wanted to have their grievances heard, uh, were finally acknowledged by the USDA as being um, a group of folks who had been discriminated against. Gotcha. So this decision has already been made. Uh, the, the verdict has been awarded, but your job isn't done. Is that right? No, my job certainly isn't done. This was justice for the farmers, but you know, every day we fight on behalf of justice for those who be in, who have been injured uh, by the negligence of of others. So that 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 same sense of justice, that same sense of having the right to uh, pursue life uh, and to do it uh, here in America, is something that we fight for every day. Gotcha. Um, so can you give us a, a walkthrough of all of the things that people are going to find if they get a copy of this book, Just Harvest? What, what, is, the, uh, what is the basic story uh, that they're going to see? Uh, and what is the ultimate resolution? Obviously, we, we've hinted a lot of that in, in this conversation, but, but tell people why they need to read this book. Um, well, I'll tell you about the book, and then I'll tell you why I think you need to read the book. Uh, about the book, uh, the, the first part of the book is really more of a personal memoir of who I am and how I got to the point where I became the lead counsel and uh, in this lawsuit. And then I do a very deep dive into the history of black farmers in America and going all the way back to slavery. Uh, you know, one of the things that, the, or the only thing that, that the slaves were, uh, the only luggage I would say that they were able to bring with them when they were brought to America was their knowledge of farming. Uh, and they caught, they, 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 the slaves got here they would work uh, the farms for, you know, hundreds of years. We know America's history on that. And ultimately, when they were uh, freed by the Emancipation Pro Proclamation, um, many of those farmers did what they knew best, or many of those folks did what they knew best, which was continue to farm. Um, uh, you know, and some of, the, some of these farmers became very successful entrepreneurs when they were given the opportunity to uh, compete, uh, given their knowledge of farming for for many years, but you know, ultimately, when the government got involved and it kind of tilted the, the the playing field somewhat, that they were not going to be able to compete with their um, their neighbors uh, in terms of farming. And really, you know, in in 1920, there was about uh, 926,000 black farmers in America. By the time I got involved in the case, there was less than 40,000 black farmers wow. in America. Um, Sure, there was a migration, a vast migration across America of folks moving from the rural areas to the big cities. But I believe, and one of the things that I've uncovered in litigating this case and in talking to uh, many of the farmers who have been aggrieved is that they would work hard enough to send their kids off to college to get a good education, to, uh, to make something of themselves. And then those children of the farmers 
um, were not coming back to the farm to go back to farming. They had so seen the discrimination and the disparate treatment that their parents had experienced. And the last thing they wanted to do was go back to the to the rural rural areas where they where they grew up. So they migrated to these other cities. And what that did is that wiped out the the family structure that these farmers had built over the years. You know, there's something about being able to get up every day uh, and go to work with your family member in order to uh, provide uh, a good for someone else to in order to uh, work the crops, work the land. There's something about that family structure that it that that ties it together. In addition to that, many of these farmers and these families were able to pass the land down to the future generations, therefore creating generational wealth. Well, that's that was lost as well because uh, many of the farms were lost, uh, and those farms that weren't lost. Um, were, were split among so many uh, descendants that ultimately, for one reason or another, would be taken or bought by, by someone else. So it really destroyed not only the Black farmers, but really a segment of America, and it hurt America because, you know, in, 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 in the early 1900s, Black farmers were probably 11, or Blacks uh, were 11 percent of the population, I'm sorry, Black farmers were 11 percent of all farmers. However, they provided 30 percent of the food that America ate at the time. Um, so that's what those those are the things that we lost that that, that family structure, that um, that generational wealth, and um, and and ultimately just some really good folks who were doing the best they could with what they had. Gotcha. I have to imagine that this case took a lot of time. Can you give our listeners just an idea of, of how many hours went into? this case and how it compares to maybe a normal case that you would take. I know that every case that you litigate is different and some are going to be really long. Some are going to be, you know, very quick settlements, but how, how long did this case take uh, versus a regular case that you might take? This case took much longer than any case that I've ever had. Uh, in fact, I'm still involved in the, in the, in the case and dealing with uh, settlement funds. Um, but it was extended for, for a number of reasons is that, uh, first of all, the litigation, uh, which we have in every case or in most cases, um, was was extended. But in addition to that, after we reached a resolution, there was a whole process that we had to go through afterwards. Um, so the initial farm bill was in 2008. Um, I believe we settled the case in, in, in 2010. Uh, but it wasn't until 2012 before we actually began the process of now going out and meeting the farmers and assisting them and uh, preparing their claims forms uh, in order for them to even be considered for this. So uh, I myself, uh, my practice was consumed with this case I for uh, at least four years where I did very little other than this case. Uh, as I said before, one of the issues with the case before was that the, many of the farmers weren't aware of their rights of, 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 uh, or weren't aware in a timely fashion that in fact, um, the U S government was going to, uh, consider and compensate them if they could prove the discrimination. So I knew it was important to get out there and get that message out there to those farmers. And there's no better way to do it than go into someone's living room. Now I didn't literally go into a whole bunch of living rooms, but I certainly did get in my car and drive, throughout rural America, anywhere from Oklahoma to Mississippi to Alabama, and had meetings uh, with farmers to inform them that, in fact, uh, if you've been aggrieved and if you uh, believe that you've been discriminated against or you're, uh, you're a descendant against someone who has been discriminated against, that now is the time uh, for you to step forward to, to provide that evidence uh, so that it can be heard. Gotcha. How has the reception to all this been? The reception to the resolution to, of the, to the resolution of the case, and of course, also to the book. How how are people? What what are you hearing from people who are hearing both the the resolution of this case, the largest uh, of its kind in in history, and also uh, to the book? And and how are people receiving it? Well, I I think that uh, first of all, most people are shocked when they hear about it. This is not a story that has been told uh, ever before, really. Not in a not in a not in a way that I have in this book. Um, so most people are shocked that this actually happened. Um, in, in, in addition to being shocked that it actually happened, you know, there are those on, 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 some, on one side who will say, well, 
you know, they've gotten their reparations. To those people, I would say simply, look, this case involved discrimination between 1981 and 1996. We, we, we have not even begun to go back uh, even further than that in order to, uh, to compensate uh, the black farmers. So I, I think it's important. I think it's important for America to hear this story, to understand the history of black farmers and black farming in America before, um, before really making a decision as to whether uh, this compensation was just or not. I, 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 you know, for me, one, $1.25 billion obviously is a lot of money, but when you consider what was really lost in this case, the generational wealth that was lost, the generational knowledge or the knowledge of farming that was not passed along to, uh, to children or children who went away to school, to college and never came back to the farm because understanding that they were not gonna get a fair shake for it. When we consider all of those things that were lost, we consider 926,000 black farmers down to less than 40,000 black farmers. Um, I don't know that that 1.25 begins to uh, really compensate. It, well, it just begins to compensate the farmers for what they've been through. And this latest stimulus bill, there was a $5 billion set aside for debt relief. Um, and I think that that is another step in the process. The important, one of the important things that my case did or that the black farmer case did is that um, it, it, it gave the USDA a new awareness. There was an evaluation of a system that the system itself wasn't flawed, but how it was being implemented was flawed and was biased. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that one of the biggest challenges we have in America today is looking at systems and seeing, uh, is there a disparate impact on uh, any one group of people? And why is that? Is that as a result of some type of bias, that results of some type of corruption, or is this really how the process works? So I think, you know, here in America, we need to, to evaluate the systems, reevaluate them. This is not a one and done type thing. Um, uh, reevaluate the systems and then look at the folks who are implementing uh, these systems. Gotcha. So what's next for Greg Francis? What do you, what, what's the next big thing you're working on? I know right now you're, you're still working on making sure the money gets paid to who it's owed and everything else. What's next? Uh, the, the journey for justice continues. You know, we represent uh, ver various individuals and class actions. We, like I said, we have a number of uh, medical devices uh, or drugs that we are, are litigating on behalf of, of hundreds of clients, if not thousands of clients. Uh, but it's, it's just a continued uh, desire for me to seek justice for those who can't speak for themselves. Gotcha. That makes sense. Um, well, here in a minute, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take our conversation. We'll be a little more lighthearted. Um, I'm going to give you some magical powers. Uh, we are going to travel through time and we're going to stumble across young Greg and you're going to give him some advice. Um, and I'm also going to loan you my pen, Greg. And this magic pen, uh, it, is, it is the best pen I've ever written with. We are not sponsored by Papermate, but I'm a big fan of the Inkjoy pens. But this one in particular can strike laws from the books. It can also amend laws, change laws, add laws, etc. So in a minute, I want you to percolate on this. I'm going to give you access to my pen. And with it, you can change something in the law that affects you uh, or affects all of your, your clients in, in some capacity. So think about that for a minute. Uh, while right. we do that, we're going to jump back over really quickly and make, make sure people know. Uh, I know we were looking at this for a good long while, uh, but this is justharvestbook.com, uh, which is where you can uh, order Greg's book right now. And again, it is available everywhere you go, bookshop.org, amazon.com, Barnes and Noble, BAM, Apple Books, Google Play, everywhere. Uh, the website says pre-order, but it just came out uh, this week. Uh, I know they'll get that stuff updated, but you can get it uh, basically anywhere you buy books. So please go there and, and, and buy a book. Uh, also, uh, obviously, uh, realtoughlawyers.com is Greg's personal website uh, of his law firm uh, that he is uh, a partner of. Uh, they uh, work, obviously, doing personal injury uh, in the Florida area uh, with, with offices in Boca Raton and in, in Orlando, but they do work with clients all across the United States. So if you have been injured in any of these issues, uh, and you can see right here on the on the screen, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, lots of different issues, lots of different places um, that they uh, have been involved in. So if you've been involved in any of those, please feel free to reach out to uh, to Greg and to his law firm. Um, before I ask you those questions, before you give us those uh, the answer to those questions, we're going to read from one more sponsor here. 
Our second sponsor today is Rocket SEO from hundreds of customers. If you're a local business owner, you know that being on page one of Google is important, but maybe you're afraid to work with a search engine optimization company because you know that SEO is both expensive and slow. Well, it doesn't have to be, not anymore. Rocket SEO from hundreds of customers forces you to page one of Google safely and legally through the power of the news media. Rocket SEO utilizes national news media campaigns across the gamut of news sites that simply rank instantly. With Rocket SEO, you can boost your website's rankings in Google in one week or less with a simple system that leverages the power of major media companies, news sites and network affiliates of ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox, as well as local news sources from the Boston Herald to the Sacramento Bee and all stops in between across the United States to put you on page one of Google in under a week, oftentimes multiple times on page one and many times for dozens of different keywords. To learn more, email press at hundredsofcustomers.com or visit hundredsofcustomers.com slash rocket that's hundreds of customers.com slash rocket all right so greg we'll be a little more lighthearted here for a minute and uh, i'm going to loan to you my magical pen and with this magical pen again you can strike any law from the books you can change any law um I, as an attorney i know you have keen insights into various facets of the law uh, and some of them may be minor things there may be just annoyances in the law like you have to fill out a form in triplicate every time you represent a client or something like that what would you change if i gave you my magic pen what would you change in the law that affects yourself or affects your clients you know, Justin, with that magic pen, I, I don't, I don't think we need to uh, to change any laws, or I wouldn't change any laws necessarily. I wouldn't uh, amend any laws. I would simply, with that magic pen, ensure that the laws that we have on the books are actually being implemented, are actually being enforced, uh, and 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 in a way that it was uh, intended at the time. So I think that it's not necessarily a, a bunch of new laws that we need. I think it's a, I think it's we need a a actual implementation of the laws. And consideration of it, um, uh, uh, of those laws, uh, in a in a very equal and um, un arbitrary way. I think that's fair. Uh, hopefully, my pen is up to the challenge. <laughs> right. All right. So let's assume my magical pen can also travel back in time, and we see a young Greg, and he's fresh out of law school, and uh, maybe he doesn't know what his trajectory is right now. What advice would you give to yourself outside of the same advice everyone wants to give, which is buy a whole lot of Bitcoin right now before he goes off? <laughs> <laughs> what advice would you give a young Greg, and of course, by extension, any burgeoning attorney who is looking to get into the practice of law? Uh, the thing that I would suggest to young Greg is to be intentional. To, uh, to think about where you want to go, make a decision on where you want to go uh, ultimately, and then make the decisions that will put you in place to, to, to reach those, those ultimate goals. Also to believe in yourself. Uh, I'm a proud, proud uh, descendant of uh, Afro-American Caribbeans who were brought to the Panama Canal in order to build a canal because the, uh, the, the, the weather down there was so tough that only those people who were indigenous to that area were able to, to really survive uh, in those uh, in those circumstances. So understanding that, you know, I come from a, a very proud heritage. Um, I would tell myself, or I would tell a young Greg to believe in himself and to be intentional about uh, whatever it is you uh, you your goals are. That's great advice. And I think it's advice that everyone listening to this can, can definitely profit from. So absolutely wonderful advice. Well, Greg, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I know it's later you're there, your time there uh, than it is here. Um, I always like to let my guests get the last word in, and I'm sure you've got a little bit to say. So uh, can you leave our listeners with just a little bit of wisdom uh, or, or a message that you'd like to leave them with? Sure. Um, look, it, it, the, the Black Farmer case involves systemic uh, discrimination, uh, and and we, we got a resolution on that, and there's an awareness of that, uh, and I think it's important to tell this story so that it doesn't happen again. Uh, but my message to the, the the listeners out there will be a kind of a forward message of what's next, what what how do you lean in? How do you how do you uh, change this to ensure that this type of thing doesn't happen again? And I can tell you, me personally, I have started a the Greg Francis Just Harvest Foundation, uh, and the purpose of that foundation has three principles: family, uh, entrepreneurship, and education. I have uh, endowed a scholarship at the University of Florida uh, for graduates of HBCUs, so that you know, that we will be that we we'll, we will be able to recruit the best students to the University of Florida, a very top tier law school, um, and alleviate the 
financial burden that goes along with any type of graduate school, namely law school. Uh, in addition to that, um, I've partnered here locally. I, I'd encourage people to get involved locally. I've partnered here locally with a church, and we have a transition home where we have families who have either fallen on hard times or just are in that gap where they're not able to save money to uh, get their own home. So we allow them to move into the house for six months. Uh, they they pay their they they continue to pay rent, but at the end of those six months after going through credit classes, after understanding uh, budgeting uh, and those type of things, that money is returned to them. And of the four families that we've helped uh, thus far, two of them have gone on to be, to be homeowners. And then lastly, um, uh, from a, in terms of entrepreneurship, you know, we have a partnership with uh, Four Rivers, um, I'm sorry, uh, Four Roots uh, Foundation here, which is gonna have an urban farm here in central Florida that will provide education and knowledge to uh, young African-American students who may be involved in farming to teach them about farming, but not just about farming, but the actual business of farming. So I, I think it's important to get involved. You know, a community only works if those in the community come together and work together. And that's, that's certainly my goal, uh, with the foundation. And as a law firm, that is our goal to provide, you know, that type of cover for our clients. Absolutely. There's a mission I can get behind 100%. I've always been a firm believer. Uh, family, utterly, crucially, crucially important. Um, obviously, education, you know, what you know, what you take with you. It's the one thing people can't take from you. You can lose all your money. Right. You can lose all your wealth, but you can't you can't lose your education. And of course, that entrepreneurial spirit, I think, is one of the things that is, is unique about our country, really. It really engenders that entrepreneurial spirit. And right. uh, nothing makes people take a hold of their destiny like like that that spirit so i, I utterly agree with all that stuff it's great um well greg and again i don't want to take up too much of your time thank you so much for being with me today here on the attorney post i've really enjoyed this conversation i feel like i've learned a lot i've been really impressed um with everything you've had to share with us uh for our listeners down below uh please remember to go down below and uh, visit justharvestbook.com that's justharvestbook.com get a copy of greg's book i'm going to order one right after we get off this podcast i want to read it myself and uh, when i'm done with that hopefully i'll we'll have time to to shoot a, a review of the video for you guys um you've been listening to the attorney post uh my name is justin west i am your host as always uh of course uh, it is important to note that uh, though this is a podcast where we talk to lawyers this podcast does not constitute to legal advice. If you do have legal advice, you should always seek the advice of a competent attorney in your area who focuses on the matters that you need help with. Obviously, if you've been injured uh, and you uh, are, especially if you're in the Florida area, but even if you're not, I think you could do far worse than working uh, with Greg and his law firm. Uh, and again, there's a link down below as well uh, to his law firm. And as a reminder, that's realtoughlawyers.com, which again is a sweet sweet URL. Uh, this is the Attorney Post. You can find us online at theattorneypost.com. As always, we are also available anywhere you listen to podcasts, Amazon, Stitcher, Spotify, Google, Apple, etc. We always do appreciate a like, a subscribe, a share, and a comment. So please feel free to leave those below. And until next time, remember, if you don't know your rights, you don't have any. Thank you for listening, guys, and take care.